thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I guess for this forum, I don't need to set much of a stage, but since um, I don't really know what happened before I joined, let me briefly comment on uh, post-quantum cryptography. So you mentioned already there were the workshops of post-quantum cryptography. Um, and so this has been going on. We have had the 2022 edition. I should have updated this slide. So this one was fully online. 2021 edition was in Korea, actually nice as, as a hybrid. Several people attending in person in Korea. And so I do hear some echo. It, it would probably be good to mute the microphone. All right, let me try again. So we're going back to the early 90s um, when Shaw's algorithm started and therefore we have a motivation to do quantum algorithms. And then for some time there was, um, well, people working on this, but we needed a name. So the name post-quantum cryptography comes actually from a mailing list posting from Dan Bernstein, where he said, hey, look, we need some name. We need to say, well, I'm working on X, where X is a short, and most of the time we say PQ crypto rather than post-quantum cryptography. Um, and so he said, this area where we're studying systems under the assumption that the attacker has a quantum computer needs a name. And you already mentioned um, in the opening that NIST has been running for a while. And so the deadline was in 2017. And like a year ago, we all expected NIST to make an announcement because it was about time for the end of the third round. Um, 2021 came and went. And then um, there was more announced. So if you could mute some, your end, that would be helpful. So then the, the um, announcement was postponed, postponed, postponed. Eventually it happened on the 5th of July. At NIST announced the first elections. And then later this year, well, they will continue to study. You mentioned Plastic McLeese is an ongoing fourth round. Um, there's also an upcoming um, signature standard from NIST, um, but we don't actually know how long it will take till NIST actually issues the post quantum standards. They're hoping next week, uh, next year, or the year after, but even that is unclear. So I totally understand why other countries would go ahead after all of these delays and say like, hey, maybe we should go ahead and do our own. I also know that several countries in Europe have been issuing uh, recommendations because it is urgent to get people started. The categories, and I've seen that in your program, you had already quite a few categories. So you have seen talks on most of these systems, maybe with the exception of hash-based, you had a, um, I don't think you have a hash-based signature scheme there. So these are kind of mathematical assumptions where we think that a quantum computer cannot break them. But of course, it depends a lot on how they are instantiated, how they turn into a crypto system, whether this makes it a secure system or not. So it's, it's a warning, it's a category of a mathematical system, and it might still be insecure. And for instance, in this submission, out of the 69 submissions, there was about a third which was broken, and some of them were broken pretty badly. So... I'm still listing isogeny-based cryptography, even though their most uh, visible proponent psych was broken at the end of July. Um, it is one particular system that was broken and it was broken in a way where people were like, this part is suspicious. We shouldn't have this. Now, it got broken in a way that we didn't really foresee partially and partially it was like, yes, of course, this must be one of the ingredients. But it doesn't mean that all of isogeny-based crypto, it's still, well, handle with care is the new kid on the block, but it is also something which has, well, attraction because it's small. Lattices is the topic of this talk. Codes, yeah, MacLeese, you mentioned in the introduction, is of course a topic dear to my heart, but it's also sort of a boring topic because the system is there and nothing really happened. Um, so I'm talking today about lattices and a particular type of lattices. So lattices are an important topic also for the NIST winners. So out of the four winners, Kaiba, Dilithium, Falcon, and Swings, three, the first three are lattice-based systems. And Swings, okay, it's a system based on hash functions. 
Um, I thought it was a rather odd choice because to me, the most urgent task that we have is to encrypt our data today. So making sure that the attacker who has a quantum computer tomorrow and is recording our conversations today will not be able to read them. So to me, the most urgent thing to roll out is post-quantum encryption or CHEMS everywhere. And NIST only included one CHEM and three signature schemes. Now you might go, I'm a loser because class time release was not taken. And I agree, I find it very irritating that class time release was not taken because it is a kind of a safe bet. And if people want a safe bet, then why not give it to them? But it's one of the runner ups. So there are four schemes where they said, oh, they might be selected later. So class time release, it's a code based system with very little structure and huge keys and bike and HQC are based on codes, but they're much smaller than the classic release. Psych, I mentioned already as the system based on isogenies, which was spectacularly broken within like less than a month after this announcement. So July 5th, they announced it on July 30th, all submissions, I mean, like all categories, all security levels to NIST were broken of Psych, just in one go. Now, Letter based cryptography has a bit of a better history than uh, than isogeny based cryptography. So it goes back to 1992. There were two systems. Um, I'm picking out the one which is kind of the more influential one in that it has given rise to the system that we're looking at. So that's uh, Entro from Hofstein, Pfeiffer, and Silverman. And what they're doing is they're working in a polynomial ring. So you're having the integers modulus some x to the m minus one. So we're looking about cyclotomic polynomials. x to the m is equal to one. And then they're looking at two different moduli. There's a q, which is typically a power of two, and then a small modulus three. And combining them in some intricate way, in some intricate way, so that you can encrypt and decrypt. There have been several works in between, but I think the next most influential one was uh, LPR, so Lubashevsky, Pygat, and Regev, where they, well, I'm saying introduced because, I mean, the system at the base is, is again using this integer, uh, integer polynomials, modular cyclotron polynomial, and they're also giving some relationship to other lattices. Where what they're proving is, um, well, at the bottom, there's security of a truly practical system. That's what they're defining. And then there are these arrows between those um, which state what pieces go in. So they're assuming that worst case problem on lattices are hard. Now, it's actually not general lattices, it's ideal lattices. And ideal lattices is not ideal in the, well, this is great. This is as good as it gets. Ideal in the mathematical sense. So you have a ring, and then you have a subset of a ring which has certain mathematical properties that isn't ideal if the properties are that it's a group under addition and it's closed under multiplication by any element from the ring. So that kind of ideal. And so we're looking at this polynomial ring, and then we have an ideal in this polynomial ring, and we're building a lattice from that. And so the assumptions here, there is some, well, hoping there's some sprinkling that ideal lattices are not so different from other lattices. And that's actually where today's talk is hooking in, saying, well, there are some things in ideal lattices that we don't have in general lattices. Now, all the candidates that NIST selected were um, based on ideal lattices. So this is an important class. But it's also a class that worries me somehow. Um, when we designed the Entropy Prime system, we tried to, well, we still needed structured lattices, but we tried to reduce the structure as much as possible. So structured lattices typically are using cyclotomics. Now, Entropy started this with having a prime in the exponent, so x to the m minus 1, where m is a prime. And LPR and all the winners in the Guinness competition are using power of two cyclotomics. So this n up there, uh, sorry, the m up there, that's like two n, and then you can factor this into, well, 
n plus one, uh, x to the n plus one and x to the n minus one. And we're looking at this for powers of two. So we're looking at n being two, four, six. Okay, those are too small. And then um, the way that the winners are structured, this n might be as small as 128, 256, because you're building larger classes of them. And then this ideal SVP, so SVP stands for shortest vector problem. And the ideal, as I said, an ideal is a subset of a ring. So that's this I inside R, which has this property that you can add elements in there. Now, for an ideal, like for lattice, you can define a basis. And okay, you see already how these things are related. So you're having your basis or ring elements, and then the ideal is the linear span of these basis elements. So you're having some n-dimensional lattice, and well, you're having n um, vectors, and they span an n-dimensional lattice. Or you can also look at those as an ideal um, in this ring. Okay, so here's an example, a very small one. For the small prime power four. So we're only looking at prime powers larger than two. I mean, powers of two larger than two. And we're not looking at the powers of two that is just one, except for in one little example. So here on the left, if you're having a bunch of examples, these are polynomials. And I'm looking at the ideal that these four polynomials are generating. So I'm allowed to take integer linear combinations of these polynomials. And then I want to have something which is relatively short. So for instance, I'm taking two times the first one, plus three times the second one, minus five times the third, minus two times this last one. And you see this last one is bringing in a very large coefficient, but also these coefficients are pretty large. Then I'm getting something where all coefficients are small. Okay, here's a negative coefficient, but all of these coefficients are small. And then how you get from here to there, well, that actually needs work. If you're in such a small example, you can do this basically like in linear algebra, you're taking rows, you're adding them to each other. So I'm taking this uh, bottom row and I'm reducing with the previous row. I'm going from zero to minus one. I'm oh, sorry, I'm taking the first row. I'm taking this one, this bottom one minus the first one. I'm getting a minus one here and it gets much smaller. And then I'm taking um, the next row to reduce here. I'm taking this row to reduce here. And so I continue by pairwise reduction between any of these two rows until the numbers get kind of mannered, kind of small. And you can see it's still happening. And now the last row, okay, up to sign is actually is the negative of what I had on my previous slide. I'm getting um, the solution I showed you. So remember, this is the column which had the constant this is x to the one, x squared, x cubed. And so we can read off the negative of this polynomial. So this works pretty well if you have small dimension. If your dimension is four, then we're getting this very efficiently. You saw it's just a few steps. And you can always do this computation. You can always try to reduce with pairs of them. You look what is the closest, and then you reduce here, and you reduce here, you reduce there. But when your lattice has a large dimension and it's not a friendly lattice, then this doesn't actually reach very short vectors. Okay, so what do we have? Um, how short do these get? Let's see what is possible in terms of shortness. So now I need a little bit more of a notation. So here we're looking at the cyclotomic ring, well, the in ring of integer polynomials modulo x to the n minus uh, plus one, which is a factor of x to the two n minus one. So x is the two nth root of unity. And so this, this zeta here, the zeta sub two n, this is a two nth root of unity. Now that is a complex number. So you can think of this as well, e to the two pi i divided by the two n. It's a complex number. And on the other side, you have the, the number field, you have the Q adjoint zeta to n. And so depending on which of these uh, roots you're mapping to this 
e to the 2 pi i over 2 n, um, you're getting a different embedding. Think of a very small example where you have the complex numbers um, and then plus i and minus i. So those are your two choices. And you're either picking the plus i or you're picking the minus i. And of course, depending which one you're taking, you're getting the number or you're getting its conjugate. And so in number theory, we talk of these as embeddings. So we're taking the field K and we're embedding it into the complex numbers. And well, there are, for I, there was plus I and minus I. And in general, if you have two nth roots of unity, well, those which are primitive roots of unity, those are the odd powers of this thing. So that's why I'm having the um, one, three, five, et cetera, till n minus one here. And then it's nice that if you look at those symmetrically, so you're taking the plus one, two, three, uh, sorry, one, three, five, and you're having the minus one, three, five. So depending on which direction you're going to. We'll also use the complex absolute value. So that's just Z times Z bar. So that's just the, the I part flips to the negative. So for the, for the bar, this is just the complex embedding, the, the trivial one with the two numbers. And up here, we're going for all the n different embeddings. OK, so to get to the lattice that we're actually normally looking at, that is called the Minkowski embedding. So we're taking our ideal, this, this subset of the ring of polynomials mod x to the n plus 1. And then we're getting an, a lattice out of this as follows. So this is not just taking 1 times the copy but we're taking as many copies as we have embeddings. So this is a different lattice than I showed you before. So the 1000, uh, the 10,009, uh, sorry, 1009 gets mapped to, well, we're taking the first embedding. Well, a constant always stays the same. So it gets mapped to 1009, 1009, uh, 1009, et cetera. If you have a polynomial, then it gets more interesting. So X maps to different roots of unity. So it maps to different um, powers of zeta eight, namely exactly these odd powers and then the negative of them. So this one polynomial turns into these four entries here and the same happens to the next polynomial. So if I'm taking X and mapping it to a zeta eight to the minus three, so that's the third entry here, then x squared goes to zeta eight to the minus six, just the square from up here. And then the constant, well, stays the constant. So now I'm having a four dimensional lattice, the same dimension as I had before. And I can compute what the co-volume of this lattice is. That depends on the dimension and on this big constant. Okay, and that gives me, well, it's 11.27 to the four. The reason that this matters is that that will give me a lower bound on how short a vector can possibly be. So in this particular lattice, I'm now looking and I'm always moving between the lattice side and the number theory side. So on the lattice side, I'm having bounds like, okay, I can use the LL bound, I can use Minkowski, et cetera. On the, um, on the ideal side, on the number field side, I'm also working with, with norms and I'm working with, with products of elements, all these embeddings. And now if I'm looking at both of these, so I'm looking at the true norm of an element. So this is now an element in my lattice. Then this has as entries, these different embeddings. So the true norm of this thing is taking this embedding absolute value squared, this embedding, absolute complex absolute value squared, et cetera. And then the sum of those and the square root. If I look at like triangle inequalities, like the normal translations, I can take out, these are n summons, so I can take out its square root of n, and I can lower bound this by a power of those guys, and then to with the nth root here. And then I need another piece from the number theory side. So if I'm looking at the size of the ring mod G, so if I'm looking at what happens if I'm taking this ring and I reduce mod this element G, which is an element of I, 
then this gives exactly the size of this. Um, well, in general, it's a ring if it's a uh, if it's an irreducible polynomial. If it was a polynomial, it would be a field. In general, it's just a ring. I'm looking at the size of this. That is at least as large as if I'm doing this with i, because g is an element of i. And so I'm getting my bounds here. Well, this is exactly what's in there. So I'm getting the, this is the size of r over i. And this is the size of the co-volume there. So I'm doing one jump here and then taking from up here the co-volume. So now I have linked a lattice information to information of the ideal. So let's do this in the example. So we had found this relatively short vector, this 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus minus, uh, minus 5x plus 1 that you see here. This is the embedding of it. So this is applying these four maps up here. I'm seeing these maps here. I will be doing the same computations on this again. And then I'm getting this result. So this short polynomial corresponds to this embedding. I mean, that one is kind of obvious. So we're taking the, the x and the maps to zeta 8, zeta 8 cubed, zeta 8 to the minus 3, zeta 8 to the minus 1. And then I'm looking at the size of this vector. Now the relationship between those is actually the same. You're getting the coefficients back. So there's a nice interplay between those sides here. And then if I'm looking at this norm, OK, then that gets me 12.49, which indeed is larger. So we just calculate the co-volume up here. It's indeed larger than this co-volume. So this is a small example, but you see that our lower bound, well, is indeed a lower bound. And we're not at the lower bound, but there's also no guarantee that we can't, that anything exists this small. We just know it can't be smaller than it. So this again, it came from any G that we're getting as linear combinations is still an element of the ideal. And so we can upper bound, uh, we can lower bound the two norm of the element by using the nth root of the co-volume of the ideal. And okay, that one we can just compute there. So given the ideal, you know where you might want to go to. Even if the ideal doesn't have a nice basis, you can compute this. So you know what you could aim for. And then the tricky part is how to find this g. There are also upper bounds. So Minkowski's geometry of numbers says within this expression, again, related to the co-volume of the ideal, or the nth root thereof, uh, you can find an element. Now, what I need from this slide is not all the gory details. What I, need, <clears throat> what I need from this is not all the gory details. What I need is the ratio between this one and this one. So that one is known as the Hermite factor. So this Hermite factor is just taking the short G that you get. So it's a quality of how good the G that you found is. And what Minkowski says is we have an upper bound on this quality. This quality, well, there is an element which is within this expression. So that's two times n over two factorial. Remember our twos are uh, our n's are powers of two. So n over two is an integer. And then the nth root of this pi over, well, square root of pi, uh, one over square root of pi. Okay, so if you look at this eta in different sizes for n, you see that this bound goes up. So for four, it's just 0.35, for 512, it's 11.03, so it gets larger which is a reason why we typically don't look at eta itself. We're looking at eta to the power, well, to the nth root of eta. Because this one grows, I mean, the eta itself grows like the square root of n with some factors. So we now have a lower bound and we have an upper bound. This does not guarantee that we have an algorithm which is good enough to get there. What we can find, and here's a list of algorithms that, well, you certainly have seen LL as a nice algorithm to combine this. 
This is basically what my example was doing. You're doing pairwise reduction of your vectors. That can reach these, well, this is the Hermite factor and then the nth root of it. So this can reach the root Hermite factor of 1.022. And if you're improving your lattice basis reduction, so BKZ is a better algorithm, it's better in the sense that the output has uh, stronger shortness guarantees. So this can reach root Hermite factor, which is smaller. And here the effort goes up. So BKZ80 is an easy algorithm you can do. 160 has been achieved in public. So that's what you find on the lattice challenge. People have done this. 300 would mean a large scale attack. So as you scale up the effort required for the attack, this number gets better. So you're getting closer to how short it should be. So what this BKZ beta means, this beta means you're having inside your huge lattice, you're looking at smaller sub lattices. And in this smaller sub lattice, you're doing an exact computation, you're finding a shorter spaces. And you're doing so repeatedly so that eventually you have covered all of your lattice. The easiest to look at is LL, which is just doing pairwise shortest. And that's what you saw in my example slide. I'm taking a line here, a line there. I'm reducing this one using this. Oh, which one is the next longest? This one is the longest. I'm taking this to reduce here. Now, LL does this in a nicely structured way so that you get a, a guarantee on the output. And similarly, these BKZ algorithms do that with 80, 160, or 300 rows at once. So these are algorithms that we always have to take into account. We sort of understand how they work. Um, I'm saying sort of because there is an ingredient coming in of how you instantiate this inner loop. So the outer loop is clear. The inner loop is where you have different options of what you plug in for doing this lattice. There are enumeration methods and there are sieving methods for finding the shortest basis. And depending on what you're using, you have different expenses. And it depends on your hardware. Some of those are better with memories. Like if you want to do this on a GPU, then you probably want to go for enumeration rather than sieving. The question I want to answer in this talk is whether we can do better using this structure that we have here. So this is not a generic lattice. This is an ideal lattice. This is a lattice which is using the cyclotomic ring. And I've already shown you in defining this embedding, this Minkowski embedding, what the relationship is. But the question then is, can we use this, this knowledge about the number theory to gain more information? Okay, so I need a bit more of number theory. So this is, um, well, luckily for you, it's not an early morning talk, so I hope this is digestible. Here in the Netherlands, it's just um, almost nine o'clock now. So we have this, this cyclotomic number here. So this is the nth root of unity. Remember, my m was 2n. And if you have any um, odd c, this is again getting into the, the primitive roots of unity. So this is a primitive mth root of unity. And if you're taking any odd power of it, so power 3, power 5, power 7, then it is again in 2m root of unity. Well, if it's a 2m root of unity, a 2n root of unity, then you're taking just n, then you're getting minus one. So you can look at this as the to the power n plus one being zero, because to the power 2n, this thing is one, and so the square root of plus one is minus one. But this one matches how this polynomial looks like. So I'm having here my variable that can play the role of x. So this zeta to n to the c can play the role of x for any of the c's. OK, so for any odd c, we have this embedding. This is similar to how I defined the IMAP, this embedding map here. So this is just the same thing again, but I now want to introduce a name for it. So this is now. Um, a map indexed by the C. So I'm taking my element G and I'm mapping it to the C component. And 
well, not exactly the seized component, I'm taking the complex conjugate of it. So this thing is the complex, well, it's a, it's a complex absolute value, which is, well, I'm taking this embedding, the C embedding, and I'm taking the square of the complex value. So I'm taking the, the number as a complex number and its complex conjugate, the product of those two. So instead of having length 2n, uh, sorry, length n, I'm having length n over 2. So I'm only taking the odd numbers and I'm grouping them pairwise. Remember, I had the plus 1 here and the minus 1 there. I had the plus 3 and the minus 3, plus 5, minus 5, etc. So I'm now having only the first part because it gives me the same as the second part here. A good thing to know if you're doing this embedding and you're computing the sum over all of the, well, now it's just the odd ones, the positive odd ones remaining. So if you're taking the sum over all these guys of one element, then I'm getting something which is basically the Euclidean vector. So this is the Euclidean norm of this G up to some scaling factor. And okay, there's no square root in there. Of course, this is defined as a square. So an infinite place is a map from K to the complex numbers, which is defined, well, for the infinite ones by this index C. So the index C for C up to N minus one and only the odd numbers. So these N minus one maps give me the N minus uh, N over two um, infinite places. So places is like the same as when you're computing evaluations. You, you might have seen this in a course, say on number theory and algebra, when you're looking at what is the value at something. You might ask about the two attic valuation. Now this is an infinite valuation. So this is looking at the size. But this two attic valuation is actually what we need to do for finite places. So over the integers, this would be just, well, how often does two divide something? That gives you evaluation of, okay. If you look at the integer 14, that has power two to the one and power seven to the one. So it has positive valuation at two and at seven and nothing at three and nothing at five. We're now in a more complicated ring. So our primes are not just integers, our primes are now prime ideals. So what we're looking at is integers, like normal integers, and then we look at how they behave in this larger ring. So then we're looking at how this prime splits or stays inert uh, over there. For instance, if we're looking at the prime two, then we can look at what happens in this prime two in this psychotomic ring. And so the way to look at what happens with the two is that we're finding, in this case, just one prime ideal above two. Name the prime ideal. Well, it needs to include a two, two times r. And then we're looking at how this polynomial here factors mod two. So it matters again that n is a power of two. And so, well, if it's a power of two modulo two, then you just know that you can take out the exponent. So the easiest is one plus x squared mod two is the same as one plus x to the power two, or one plus x to the four is the same as one plus x to the power of four. So this one factors as well, one plus x to the power n. And so all of these factors are the same. And so we just have this one ideal above two. And then we're looking at how often does our g, how often is our g divisible by this prime ideal? So we're looking at what is the order of, of our element g at this prime ideal. And then the um, the place is defined by taking that in the exponent. Um, we need the negative sign for nice mathematical reasons that I have on the next slide. And we're scaling it by having as a base here, the size of the ring that you're getting. You're taking the full ring modulo this prime ideal. And so this gives you the size, it gives you the index here. And then that to the power, um, the order at G. 
So this bottom part is the same for all G. You just like for, you fix your prime P that gives you this size. And then you're looking, sorry, and then you're looking at what exponent you're getting and that's where the G comes in. There are other primes which are having a more interesting behavior than two. So two has just one prime above it. There are primes, integer primes of the form one plus two n z. So if you look at this one, then you know that in this place where we're changing perspective, this, this P here is one plus two n z. So if you're looking at this finite field, then it has the p roots of unity. Sorry, it has the nth roots of unity because if you're taking p minus one, that's the size of the multiplicative group, then p minus one is divisible by two n. And so we have all the primitive roots. Um, and so that means that this polynomial that we're looking at, this x to the n plus one, splits completely. So it's practiced into n different factors. So this means that this polynomial looks like this. And so we're getting n different prime ideals above p. We're getting p times r plus the first factor, p times r plus the second factor, p times r plus the third factor, till p times r plus this third factor times r. Let me do this as an example. So here we have our um, example for n equals four. So these are the um, uh, infinite embeddings up here. Remember, we have n over two of those. So we're just having the one and the three. And so we're taking, well, this embedding and this embedding, we're taking the complex, this is the complex conjugate, and we're taking that product that gets us the first infinite place. These two give us a second infinite place. And now we're looking for um, interesting numbers, which are of the type, well, 2n plus one, well, 2n times the integers plus 1. And in this case, well, 17 is divisible. 17 minus 1 is divisible by 8. So that's the first example we have here. And then if you look at how this polynomial, this x to the n plus 1 factors mod 17, then you're seeing that uh, 2 and 8 are roots of it. OK, so if I'm taking 2 to the 4, then I'm getting minus 1. Um, and so that's that's one of the roots, and I'm getting the third power of it as the next root. And the complex conjugates here as well. So these are four finite places above 17. And so I can look at the evaluation at my g, can compute this order at this ideal, at this prime ideal, and that gives me these four evaluations. So these are four examples of finite places. Okay, 41 is another number, which is, if I'm taking minus one, it's divisible by eight. And so I'm getting the factorization of this x to the n plus one mod 41. And there, of course, then again, four of those, et cetera, et cetera. So when I'm looking at where I can have finite primes, then I have two, that always works. And I have these primes that are of the shape two n plus one or two n times an integer plus one. So in the title, I was using S units and somebody was asking me in the break what S stands for. S is just the standard name of the set. So let S be a set, which includes all the infinite places and then includes some finite places. So all places of K means we're taking, well, they have the infinite places and then the finite places. Now, finite places, well, you're looking at any anything above an integer prime. So there are infinitely many of those. So we need to have some restricted set as we want a finite set S. And what we typically want in cryptanalysis is that our S has um, the shape that it's primes less than some Y. So this is the same if you're doing factorization with a number field sieve or you're doing index calculus attacks on the discrete log problem. You're putting your factor base, and this S is going to be our, well, similar to a factor base. You're putting an integer bound on it, and that makes it easy to say, well, is this one in or is it not? 
Um, if you're looking at papers on S unit text, there is some complication in the notation whether S is the things in addition to infinity or does it include infinity. For me, it always includes infinity. So elements of this, this field K here that are S units, that means they only have evaluations at the units. Well, okay, everybody has um, infinite has infinite evaluations, has infinite places. So the interesting question is, does it factor into primes outside this range? So in my example of 14, I would need a two and a seven. Down here, I have an example, again, just using the integers, even though I said n equals one is not a valid number. Um, so if I'm taking in my S infinity, which I must, and then two and three, then I can have all numbers which are products of powers of two and powers of three. And okay, I'm also allowing plus and minus. So there are units in this field times powers of two times powers of three. In more generality, well, I'm taking elements in this, well, invertible elements in this, in this field. And then it's an S unit if G times R, so R is this ring again, can be written as prime powers only using the primes in S. Remember that primes here are now not integer primes. These are prime ideals in this ring R. So that means that outside S, so other places, the valuation is always one. So if you're looking at a vector, which we always will look at, namely the log vector of this, so we're taking for each entry of, for each of the valuations, we're taking for each of the places, we're taking the log, well, then one turns into zero. So outside the set S, it will have all zeros. So it will have something about two, it will have something about 17, about 41, but it will not have anything above all the other numbers. And so, yes, these in principle are infinite vectors, if I'm looking at all possible places, but I'm only looking at the places in S, and so I'm taking a finite part and I'm getting the whole number. Okay, this S unit letters, that is taking these logs here, and remember the infinite place comes first. Now in the example of n equals one, um, it doesn't really go well with my n over two. That's why I'm normally excluding it. So we have only one infinite place, which is just the value of it. So that is taking the log base two of two. So this is a basis. So we're taking this first element, which is two. This has size log two. And then it has um, valuation, which was introduced on the previous page to back. Um, the integers mod two have size two. And I'm looking at, well, what is the order at two of two? Well, that's just one. So I'm having two to the minus one here. And then I'm taking logs. So I'm taking the log of minus two. Uh, sorry, minus comes from the exponent and then the log of two. And there is no contribution when I'm taking just two at the three part. And then I'm doing the same for the other basis vector, which comes from three. I'm getting the sizes log base, uh, log three. I'm getting nothing on the two component and it has, well, evaluation one at three. And so I'm having a minus one log three here. So that's a very small example of this lattice. If you're only taking the infinite places, then you're talking about unit attacks and the uh, blueprint of unit attacks is as follows. So you, you're defining your set, it's just the infinite places of, of K. And then, um, then you're taking an ideal. Okay, so what is then a unit? That means it's a unit in the normal sense. It's an element that is invertible in the ring. Then you're taking the input is this I where you want to find a short G you're finding some G. So you need to have, so you assume that G is, uh, that I is principal, so there is a generator. And the second step, okay, um, is a big computation, or well, self-exponential computation, if you have um, our normal computers, and it's a very big, uh, it's a very fast computation if you have a quantum computer. And then you're finding something out of your um, S unit lattice 
you're finding something which is close to G. So this is where you're solving a, a, a CVP problem. Once you have found something, you can reduce G with this. So the quality of this depends on how short the vectors in your lattice are, in this S unit lattice. And so this goes back to 2014, but Dan had a blog post saying, okay, this is, uh, well, reasonably well known in computation number theory. And so um, this might be a threat to algebraic, uh, to lattice-based cryptography. The same year, a group at GCHQ actually showed this um, as an attack to break such a lattice system. And the system that they constructed is basically the same as the 2009 system of Gentry. And they brought in, hey, you can find this, this G in step two with using a quantum algorithm. So Kramer, uh, Packard, Ducat um, did the next year, did an analysis of this previous one and showed what the asymptotic complexity is. So the Campbell, Grove, Shepard already have the algorithm already set uh -huh. for these uh, nice units. You have something which is very efficient and reducible, even with something like LL. So you don't need any fancy lattice algorithm and you can find them that is really, really short. And then CDPR is showing how short this really gets. So this is the unit attacks, but there are some limitations. For instance, I has to be principal. And so you go like, yeah, I found my way out. I'm making I non-principal. So S unit attacks as the generalization of this um, don't need that I is principal. What they're looking for is instead of a generator of G, they're looking for an S generator of uh, S generator G. So you're taking this G times R and then it's not equal to I, but it's I times, well, some prime powers, or well, there's some EP there for the primes in S. So this is a relaxation. This now works for more ideals. And then the steps, the other ones are similar to the previous ones, except for now it's S units rather than units. So the step two here um, has quantum algorithms, which is polynomial time, same as on the previous slide. So 2016, Bia Song actually did a, a cleanup of what was in uh, Campbell Grove Shepherd and um, based on a 2014 paper by Eisenträger, Hogwe, and Kitaya von Song, they showed, yes, with the quantum computer, this is polynomial time, but we also have pre-quantum algorithms, which are sub-exponential time. So you can do this now, well, at some expense, um, but it's doable. So this is not the bottleneck of step two. Step three, what really depends is that you have short vectors in your S unit letters. And so also this one goes back a while. So the title of this talk is actually stolen from, from Dan from a posting in 2016, where he has a, a blog post about how S unit attacks works. And that's showing this blueprint here and going a bit into the details of how short it gets. And you can see that there have been several more works. Um, I think when Kramer the, the, the Vizolovsky came out, it wasn't actually seen as a as a S unit attack as much as a, hey, we found a way to twiddle the um, unit attacks so that we don't need um, that I is a principal ideal. So we can now use the structure to find close principal multiples. And then it was more and more analyzed, full analysis in Pelé Marie, Henri Stelé. And you also see some more recent papers. So this is really where S unit attacks come in. Um, here are some examples of what units are. So there are some very easy units. So a unit is something which is invertible. Well, one obviously is invertible. Is X invertible? Let's go to the end here. So X to the N minus one. I know that X to the N is the same as minus one because I'm working in this ring. Well, if I'm one earlier, that means this is one over X. This means it's one over X squared. So that means these are invertible numbers. This is the same as one over X. That also means that X is invertible, X squared is invertible, et cetera. Less obviously so, um, one minus X cubed minus, uh, over X, one minus X is also invertible. Okay, this at first looks like a nice manner polynomial, but why is this thing a polynomial? So let's transform this a little bit. We need to find something where we can divide by one minus X cubed. And I'm allowed to multiply by things. Well, 
x to the n is minus one. So I'm allowed to multiply by x to the n at just saying, well, it's minus one or by x to the two n that's plus one. Well, I'm doing almost as what I just said. I'm multiplying not by x to the two n, but by x to the two n squared. Well, it's just x to the two n to the power n. And so this is nothing but this polynomial, but now I'm having an odd power of two here, sorry, two to an odd power here. So n is a power of two, n squared is an even power of two, two times n squared is an odd power of two. And if I've had an f odd power of two plus one, well, if I'm taking the odd power of two mod three, that's two plus one is zero. So this exponent is divisible by three. So I can write this as a polynomial. Well, I can write this whole thing and divide out by this one. So I'm having this, this telescopic sum um, and this is a unit. So this is a polynomial. Okay, now going back to my infinite places. So this was the C that I'm having here. So the odd numbers, I'm having what this does to it. So I'm getting the C's power. And we typically want to have this in a more symmetric way. So the unit u sub c that I'm using is um, this thing. And instead of having 2c, I'm going for minus c. This is also how I was using my embeddings before. Um, and so my uc is always going to be this one. OK, well, if I have a unit, then any power of this unit is also a unit. So if I'm looking at the units that I have defined so far, that's the powers of x and it's the powers of this u sub c. And these, any of these expressions is a unit. And if I'm looking at what the index of this is in R star, then this is the h plus. So, well, h plus is a, is a number theory object and it's looking at the uh, class number, the, pos um, the positive class number. Four powers of two fields. It's been proven under the generalized Riemann hypothesis for small powers of two up to 256. And heuristics say it's always true that this index is one. So that means this gets us all the units. Okay, so these are cyclotomic units. Cyclotomic S units, well, then I have all these primes coming in. Here is the basis of the log unit lattice for an example. I know I'm running out of time. I had a very slow start and my voice is a bit down. Um, so here's an example that I'm going to skip over. One important thing is, okay, I'm having n over two of these guys, but if you look at the sizes, if you're looking at these exponents, so how large are the values that we're getting here? Then these sum up, well, the logs of those sum up to zero. Here, by the position of my computer, it doesn't really sum up to zero because here the last digit is zero, here it's nine but up to um, a tiny numerical error, they sum up to zero. So for any element, if you're looking at the embedding into the log unit lattice, then these four values sum up to zero. So the sum of L1 to L4 here is zero. So any, uh, any unit in R is in here. And so instead of having dimension N over two, we're having n over two minus one. Okay, and a sh obviously short basis is these first three. Well, I could have picked these three. I mean, like any three of these ones are short basis. So you always have a short basis of the units coming from these u sub c's. Okay, and then what else do we have? Well, we can reduce most of these. So this is what happens in the in the step after we found this G, then we try to reduce with these. So that's well, a lattice reduction, but in the log unit lattice, not in the original lattice, but in different lattice, which might be nicer. And there's evidence that it is nicer. So we're going through this and we're reducing, reducing, reducing. At the end, um, we get a vector which is close to this G. So we're dividing by it. And so the resulting one is short. Okay. Sorry, we're subtracting it from G, which on the number theories on the ideal side means we're dividing by it. If we do this experimentally for some very small sizes, so my N here is very small, 
And we're now looking at how small this, this root harm factor is getting. Remember, this is the thing where for LL, we had this uh, 1022 and so on. So here, for admittedly very small sizes, um, the last column here is giving the shortest. The tech is really running through what I just described so far. Um, so this has the somewhat costly computation of finding a G which is um, a generator. And then if I'm looking at the other two columns, so the model is um, taking a random plane point, I mean like a plane, a point in this hyperplane to reduce. So I'm skipping the computation, but you see that this model is pretty close to what the real thing gets. And then the tweak, the tweak is kind of, well, it works, but we really understand it only once we look at S units because we're multiplying by these guys here. And you have seen these ones as um, elements of norm two coming up. So these are final places you're getting in there. And so then you're getting different ideals and you have a new chance of finding a better G each time. I do need to skip over the S units. Um, so there are ways to get nice S units. Um, other ways are, so they're nice mathematical ways. There are kind of brute forcey ways. We're just looking at everything short and say, hey, are you an S unit? Okay, yes. You're not an S unit, go away. So you're just doing the same step that we're doing with index calculus or the number field sieve all the time. We're searching and we're keeping a batch of, of good ones. So this is how we're finding our S units in the first step. And this is a one-time computation for each lattice. So we could do this and store it. We're getting some benefits by having mathematical maps between those. So if you have one nice unit, one nice S unit, you're getting more of those. And um, we can also use structures of subfields. Okay, so then something went wrong with the compilation. That's weird. Um, okay, so our S units, we have this one, which is the prime over two. We have the units that I was showing before. This is this U sub C for C equals one. We're getting random elements. We're getting random elements from subfields and we're getting these nice mathematical numbers. So this is how we're getting our S units. And here, this is indicating the automorphisms to get some more. Okay, so getting S units done, getting this G, which is an S generator. Well, either do a sub-exponential time computation or wait for a quantum computer. So how long does this whole thing take? This is a sub-exponential complexity. At least our conjecture is that this whole thing, not just the part of getting the G, but also the whole thing remains sub-exponential. And what we're doing here is using a much, much larger set of S units than any of the attempts before. So all attempts before have used a relatively small S we using an S as large as including, well, all the infinite places, of course, and then find it places where the um, size of the field here is at most Y, where Y has, well, log Y is this large. So this goes up to the same size as here, this exponent of uh, square root of N plus little of one. We're doing a big computation. We're getting all the S units or the good S units those which are smaller than this in the norm. And then um, in, rent, in this attack, while well, you're getting your i, you want to find a g. So we repeatedly run this and multiply i by some random prime in, in s. OK, well, how many primes do we have? That's where this log y comes in. And so we have about y chance of randomizing it. For each of those, we generate, get a generator, an s generator, and then we're doing computations to make this actually a valid ideal, a valid G, and then we're doing lattice reduction. Given how many vectors we have and how short they are, this should be sub-exponential time in general and get a very good root, um, very good Hermite factor. So this is getting a Hermite factor of square root of N, where most lattice assumptions or lattice systems are taking that the Hermit factor is of the size n squared. Well, they're assuming that that's hard to reach, so that's in their security assumptions. So this would be good enough to break systems that are using the 
approximately shortest vector, which all of them are doing. Um, I have a few more slides, which I'm not going to go through, but I want to show you uh, a URL. So there was some, some statements on the internet afterwards saying, hey, this can't possibly work. And so we have addressed this in a rather lengthy paper, which you can find at sunitattacks.cr.yp.to. And so this one is saying that the SUNIT attacks are um, having better features. And um, oops, I see the chat, but it's um, not easy to get to, sorry. Um, and so you can, can get the information there. Sorry for jumping over a few things. There's also uh, more evidence about the conjecture. Thank you for your attention.